Last year, Graveyard Cars was entrusted with one of the most iconic Mopar muscle cars to ever be assembled, the 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona. This real XX29 car is one of only 503 ever built. Not only did we inherit one of the coolest muscle cars of all time, but it also turned out that we inherited its owner, Tom Partridge. Back when the car first showed up, Tom had stopped by to share the story about the Daytona Charger and what it meant to him from all the way back when he was a kid. I always loved the wing cars. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't know what they were. I just thought they were a big, cool car with a big wing. And I loved them so much that I was in this group with my dad called the Indian Guides. And we built Pinewood Derby cars, and I had him actually make me a Pinewood Derby car with a big wing on the back. And then a few years ago, I was thumbing through the internet and typed in Project Daytona, and this Daytona came up. No motor, no interior, you know, but it's got the wing, it's got the rear window and the rear window trim because I know those are, you know, extremely difficult, if not impossible to find. This was something I didn't want to lose. Over the years, Tom has not only become a fan and a customer of Graveyard Cars, but he's also become a friend. And at times, he's even been part of the crew. However, it's not always roses when Tom's around. Since we moved the Daytona into the final stages and now he can see its completion in the future, he's become more and more persistent, more impatient, he's more Tom. The clock is ticking, we're running out of time, there's lots to do. If the car doesn't get done, then Tom will never leave. It has to be done. Got that car coming to get you, Barbara. The unburied dead. My name is Mark Warman. I work with my worst enemy, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! And my son-in-law, Josh. Whoa! Along with my best friend, Royal. Well, all right! And our newest team member, Holly. This is exciting. We bring dead cars back to life. If we don't kill each other. Oh, Mark. Oh. Oh. It's gonna be a bloodbath. Oh. Absolutely no letdowns this week. The pressure is on. You see Chrome Dome's back from New York. Somebody tipped him off. I got a sneaky feeling that we were maybe in trouble. I think the word snitch is a little bit harsh. All I did was call Tom. One thing led to another, and he started talking about his car and what stage it was since he had left. And I told him it hadn't been touched. Tom got worried. The Daytona is at the part, for me, that's the biggest payoff. It's the final assembly. Uh, it would be a lot funner if Tom wasn't here breathing down my neck, but apparently that's what Darren decided he wanted to do, so so Tom's here. I'm we not, already I talked about it. All these Everything. Guys. It's nice to have you out. The Daytona needs. Are you paying attention? One of the things that we're going to do first is have the upholstery guy out to install the headliner. That needs to go in before any other interior can go in the car. Once that's done, we'd like to put our brand new instrument specialties dash assembly in place. To do that, you have to have the heater box and suitcase installed, plumbed, and through the firewall. Once we get the heater box installed and install the dash, we can take it over to the bin pack, raise it up, and start putting like the exhaust system on it and buttoning up the necessary little things that are left on the bottom side of the car. Why do bald people stick together? I've noticed that. Like, <laughs> like, have you ever noticed two turds in the toilet that are shaped the same? They find a way, like kidney beans, to work around each other. It's the same thing. I haven't stared at my poop that long, Mark. So the very first thing that's happening is Larry's going to come out from Larry's Interiors and install the very unique Fastback XX29 headliner. You know what that is, right? Yep. Yeah. You do? They're so unique, you know? <laughs> same thing. Same back, same back glass, same fast top on it. See, Mark? I can pay attention. Score one for long turd. While he's doing that, I want you guys to get all the rest of the pieces prepared, finished, treated for us to be able to install the dash. So let's just make sure. Larry's headliner, you, parts, pieces, instrument specialist, dash, go. You know, Mark is really putting on a show for Tom. He wouldn't care about getting the Daytona done at all if Tom hadn't showed up unexpectedly. Meanwhile, Fester 2 is going to go to the coast for a few days, hang out, and then you're going to be back, right? Yes, I will. And when you get back, you're hoping I'll be happy. to see a lot done in your car. I'll be happy. I believe we could have the Daytona done by the time Tom gets here. If everybody pulls together. Will they? Can we? We'll see. I never let anybody down. Let me tell you something. Not I yet. never I never I never set a deadline that I haven't met yet. <laughs> How much time you got, buddy? Oh, I heard. 
Mark is like a little show dog, prancing, barking, doing whatever Tom wants him to do or say. You know, Tom is his master, Mark is the dog. Okay, everybody get to work, rock and roll. Tommy? Thanks, come guys. Come Let's on, walk buddy. across Thanks. the street and get some chicken wings. You look like a walking tapeworm. Cue ball thing. You know, yeah. you know, I didn't mean it, right? <laughs> that was a good one, Josh, actually. The Daytona right now is top priority in the shop. And while I've got the three Judases saying that we're not going to get it done, we're not going to make it, blah, blah, blah. Fact is, we will make it. That's what we do. That's what I do, OK? That's why they call me the ice cream man. Stop me when I'm passing by. True or false, Chrysler's famous Hemi orange paint is also known as Tor Red. The answer coming up after the break. So did the famous Hemi Orange name have an alias, Tor Red? The answer is true. Dodge and Plymouth, while both using a lot of the same paint codes, such as EV2, in the Dodge lineup, the EV2 was called Hemi Orange. In the Plymouth lineup, it was called Tor Red. That same principle applies across the board on their colors. FE5, our Rally Red 70 Cuda, in Dodge would be called Bright Red. And FM3, while a Dodge would call it Panther Pink, Plymouth would call it Moulin Rouge. If you're gonna call your Chryslers by the correct names, figure out which one goes with which code. Visit graveyardcars.com to learn more. The Daytona has come a long way since it showed up here at Graveyard Cars, but it still has a ways to go before it's done. We've got to get the headliner, dash, interior, and the exhaust on before we can move to the next step. The headliners in these cars are crazy because remember, they've just extended that whole back, I don't know, eight inches, 10 inches. It's, it's now a long drawn out roof. So that means the headliner on the inside has to match it that far back. And that's a long, strange shape. It's got all kinds of hills and valleys in there. The package tray is some crazy looking thing that, that only makes sense in a Daytona. If you saw it sitting outside, you just think it's junk. But when it all comes together and the headliner and the package tray and everything's in place, it's cool, and I admire anybody that's willing to break the mold like Chrysler did on the Daytona. It takes guts. It's really interesting when you start looking at how a car was assembled. Our mind tells us it was done a certain way, but the assembly line did it a different way. That's why we have the books from Dave Weiss. That's why we have all the reference material. In the case of like the Daytona's undercoating, it was hit and miss. It was splotched in here, splotched in there, and you have just a little pattern here and a little pattern over there. This gets a little light dusting of it on it, and this one doesn't. Just same thing like the primer and the fenders. When they changed them from a 69 fender to a 70, there's a footprint of where those were, where the original fenders were. You have to duplicate that if you're going to be actually truly building a car back to assembly line. That's what we do. We look at reference pictures, we take our time, we try to emulate exactly the way it was done on the assembly line. This is the very first time we've not done our own complete dash. Will the amount actually work, the gauges, this time? Well, our gauges usually work. No, But it's so cool Cuda. because Instrument Specialties has been doing it for so long. You know they won two OE Golds. They won two OE Golds. Yeah. You've never won an OE Gold. When I was in the Olympics. Okay. You won nothing. With Instrument Specialties, what it allows us to do now is to take the dash assembly out as a complete unit and send it back to Instrument Specialties in the East Coast. They disassemble it, completely overhaul it, replace everything that can be replaced or needs replaced, refinish it, rewire it, test all the gauges, make sure everything's working like it's supposed to, put it all back together with the correct finishes and the paints and the plating on it. And when it comes out of this crate, which is about to right now, it should be like it's 1969 all over again. Oh, this is gonna be beautiful, Royal. This is gonna be just gorgeous. Okay, I got the stand set there. Careful, there's rubber padding right there. That's all it. We're all going with a knife. You know how many hours it takes to do one of these, Darren? We've done them before. We've never done one as thorough, to be honest. They just do. It's what they do. Is everything new or what? You send your stuff and what happens with it? Anything that's missing, you have to supply that you you tell them that you want them to supply it, okay? So in this case, we did not have an underdash wire harness. So they bought it, they supplied us with a brand new one. If the radio's missing, you gotta supply it. Look at that. Oh my god. Wow, that's got oh my. Roll that up so I can peek at it. 
Oh. Jeez. Everything's marked. Holy crap. New faces on the clock and on the speedometer on fuel gauge temperature, oil pressure, alternator. New rocker switches. Now this is what we were talking about the other day on that other car, is what they're supposed to look like. See that texture across there? That's the factory texture. They want OE gold for that it's texture. It's sort of a little bit of a grit to it. Yep. The original Organisol black lacquer was a very rough and a very matte, if not almost flat finish. They duplicate that. Those are all the things that when you specialize in doing something, that long and that hard and you're that good at it, you can truly duplicate the assembly line process. You, you remember all the ones that we've ever built, that we've ever done, they always have problems with them. You put them in and the gauges quit working. And this is what I love is they've bench tested everything. These circuit boards, recognize the whole idea behind the circuit board. Your, your car was that way. It was different because it had that what, eight prong setup on it that would break, but these break too. So the fact that they've already bench tested it and all these trails are good. And if they weren't, they, they re-soldered them, they made them work. So we know our gauges are gonna work. I love Love this. Everything makes marked. it simple. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, usually it's plug and play and it'll only go one way, but I've said that before and been back on my back underneath the dash. It's just awesome. Everything is labeled. There's your dome circuit. This goes to the rear harness, door jam switch. So, in theory, present company excluded, it should be idiot proof. No offense, Darren. Just saying, if it says, if I come, if I crawl underneath the dash and this thing that says high, low beam switch is plugged into the dome light circuit, no. there's a reasonable chance that I'm going to cut your intestines open and have a bowel movement inside of you. And then sew you all back up again. Uh, this radio was converted. It appears to be an original one, but it is an AM, okay. FM. It takes the MP3 player and, and uh, CD player speakers in there. This is exactly like what we were doing on our Challenger dash, except that the beautiful thing about it is they did it's it what they do and they did it all. So I send it out. Now all the time that this is back there for three or four weeks, we work on doing the body and paint. We work on doing the interior. We work on getting the engine running. Now it comes and all of a sudden we're, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So with that, we're eight bolts away from having a, a dash in the car and being done. I'm glad that they're involved because it allows me to be able to focus on the million other things that go into putting a car together. Thank you. We have the correct nuts for the it. The head nut has the correct nuts. <laughs> head. Oh. Careful. You got that? You want me to hold on to the other side? I noticed the heater core, either the inlet or the outlet tube was broken because you could tell it was all crooked. So Mark's gonna have to get another one or repair that one. Well, that one part of the heater core is broken. It's all loose. It's loose? Yeah, one of the heater, where the heater hose goes on, it's broken. Pull it back out. Mark, or Josh. Pull it out. So much for that idea. Something wrong. What? The heater core. Brand new, just bought it. Uh, the guys called me down to show me that uh, there was a problem with the heater core. The heater core is brand new. I bought it personally. I gave it to Josh when he rebuilt the box. The uh, It looks like one of the water nipples where it goes into the core is broken. Hopefully it's something we can repair because it takes two days to get these heater cores. Bigger problem than that is we're out of time. Oh, nice. God dang it. Did you guys just do that? No. Did you just ram it into the firewall? I was on the outside of the car. Did you even put it up against it? Well, yeah, we were putting it in. And Darren says, hey, this is loose. You know, I can't be sure exactly what happened with the heater core. They're actually sensitive the way those pipes come out of them. I mean, it doesn't take much, but my guess is the toilet twins smashed it into the firewall instead of making it through the whole opening, and that put it in a bind and broke the, broke the fitting in the seal. So, you know, it is what it is. That's what you get when you're dealing with those guys. Um, God dang it. 5 sixteenths. Well, it's, it's got to be where the neck goes into it. God dang, we don't have the time. So we got to disassemble the box completely back down, get the heater core out, hope we can solder it, get it back in, put the heater box back in the car, and get back on track to where we were, which is putting the dash in the car, which has to go in before anything else. So, God. Oh, come on. That's our first instrument specialties dash right there, going in a Daytona Charger. It's the same exact thing. God dang it.
The headliner has been installed in the Daytona, and now we're ready to install the beautifully restored dash by Instrument Specialties. Correction, we were going to install the dash in the charger before we realized that the heater cores broke. Yeah, Mark didn't need to overreact. It was an easy fix. Just take it off, solder it, put it back together. Half an hour, a little bit less, piece of cake. One of the best things about having Royal around is he, he hangs out with plumbers all day at his job, okay? So he knows how to do all this sweating of pipes and soldering, kind of save the day. He's not a hero, wouldn't say that. I think the hero is the guy that's got the planet on his shoulders. You know, he's kind of like a miniature hero, like the little guy that maybe, I don't know, got the big guy something to drink while he was holding up the planet. You know, Royal bragged about fixing the heater core, but anybody could have done it. We could have got a, a monkey out here at the bus stop, gave him a soldering gun and some, and some solder. They could have repaired that too, so I don't know what the big deal was. And that's the only thing that Royal did the whole day. So we're ready to put the heater box in, then the dash, and then start hooking everything up. Alice, make sure that you don't actually suck the heater box flush against it. Make sure they're pushing on it so it doesn't put too much stress on the threads. So they should be flushed up, put them up by finger. You should be able to get them almost tightened all the way down. I just got to spend time with these guys. Some of them are kind of greenhorns and they get crazy, want to over tighten something and bust it. So, so what is Mark doing to help us? Just watch it. I'm trying to, you'll notice I'm trying to spend more time letting these guys get some hands on so they get their, uh, get their hands dirty, get their feet wet, whatever metaphor you want to say. He's usually a royal pain in my ass. They're learning. Yeah, except Josh, of course. Yeah. You know, everybody's, everybody's working yes. hard. Left of the car. Oh, come on! Pay attention, D. Well, I'm trying. Did you see what they're doing? Right there, right there, right there. Push it through. There, oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> there we go. Houston, we have liftoff. Once D-Rock Chips and Thunderdome got the heater box installed, bolted up, and married against the firewall with the insulation in place, all of the under dash provisions in place, we can now install the dash. Dash? It doesn't take five guys. Put you you, you two grab the dash, put it in. One guy passes through. Josh, I'll you go. The screwdriver and the bolt. For the pass through. Okay. You could pass through on the other side. That's where I'd be if I was you. It's like orchestrating a band. Let's well, on the other side, fool. You're going to have to do do why it, buddy. Is, why is Darren, whose name clearly isn't Josh, nor does it sound like it, going over there? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, oh, you are. Oh, I got to go in first. I got to go in first. You can pass through to Josh's Actually, how I have it set up. Hey, so you can go around to the other side and reset. It's worth more than your life, Josh. Be careful with it. That's our first instrument specialties dash right there going in a Daytona charger. Beautiful piece of work. Put the heater case right in there. Everything went just fine. Put the dash in. It looks great. It looks beautiful. Probably better than new. Yep, that right. looks good. That looks fantastic. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better than new. Well, and it just changes the car instantly. Better Look at than it. new. God, yep. it's that white. It's absolutely nice job, beautiful. Buddy. Yeah, that white's just going to pop in. Nice job, D-Rock. Absolutely gorgeous. Tom's really going to like this dash. Instrument Specialties did a marvelous job on this thing. I think Tom's going to look at it and just say, wow, man, this thing looks like it came right off the assembly line. Now that we have the Daytona up in the air, I'd like to take a minute and talk about the brakes. The Daytona was optioned with the power front disc brakes. It's got four piston calipers on the front. It's got 11 by two and a half inch on the rear. The Daytona has the four piston front disc brake calipers. The four piston caliper is a two piece caliper. It's got rubber O-rings in it. The fluid passes through from one side to the other. As far as maintenance goes, basic maintenance, checking your fluid, keeping the fluid clean. You should flush your fluid every three years just because Brake fluid will actually draw moisture over a period of time, even though it's a closed system. Moisture in the system will break down the brake fluid and the rest of the components. These disc brakes are thinned in the middle to dissipate the heat. You won't get the fading of the brakes like you would with front drum brakes. The disc brakes uh, do a lot better job stopping. Front drum brakes, if you've driven a car with them and got them really hot going down a hill, riding the brakes, will get really hot. And when it gets too hot, it'll boil the fluid in the wheel cylinders and you will lose your brakes. Where these finned, finned rotors will dissipate the heat a lot quicker. I think muscle cars had a big role in them producing the disc brakes because of the stopping power of the disc brakes. You get these cars with uh, 150 mile an hour speedometers, people are gonna do it. 
With the disc brakes, you get a lot better stopping power. They don't heat up. They're a good safety feature. They do make disc brake conversions. The front disc brakes being a better safety feature, in turn, were more expensive to build. I believe that's why they didn't put them on the back. You won't find them on the back of a lot of Chryslers. Typically, your front brakes, doing 75% of your stopping, will wear faster than the rear brakes. Depending on your driving habits, you replace two sets of pads to one set of rear shoes. As you can see, your front disc brake is made up of your disc brake rotor. Your wheel bearings are inside here. That's what the rotor rolls on. You've got your four piston caliper. You see the split in the middle where it's bolted together. You have your brake line coming in. You have your flex line here that allows you to turn and allows for suspension travel. You can see a couple other lines right here that go to the master cylinder and then this one heads back to the back of the car. The caliper, you can see the bleeder screw is up at the top. That's to eliminate all the air in here. You can manually bleed the brakes or you can use a power bleeder. It's, it's best to power bleed them if you can, but if not, manual bleeding. I've done a lot of. You have your distribution block here. The distribution block will distribute the fluid from the master cylinder out to the back brakes and then to each front wheel cylinder. You have the main brake line coming in here a flex line here to allow for suspension travel in the rear end. You have a distribution block here that splits it to each rear wheel cylinder. Then your rear brakes are really simple. You have your wheel cylinder, pushes out on the shoes. The shoes go out. Your brake shoes expand. You've got your return springs to bring them back closed when you let off. You got your self adjuster here that when you back up and hit the brakes, it self adjusts. It adjusts so you're moving the star. Simple, simple yet functional. You have your power brake booster. It's a rubber diaphragm. You have vacuum on this side that keeps vacuum on it. When you push on it, it the vacuum helps assist. Pushing the plunger in the master cylinder then pushes it through these lines out to the brakes. It's really important that you keep that fluid clean. Don't want any contaminants in there because it will break down the fluid and cause your brakes to go out. Cause a dangerous condition. And that's the breakdown of the Daytona brakes. The 1970 Plymouth Super Commando 440 produced a brake horsepower of 350, 375, 390. The answer coming up after the break. In 1970, the Plymouth 440 Super Commando as well as the Dodge 440 Magnum had a brake horsepower of 375. In 1971, the heads were changed slightly, and that lowered the brake horsepower to 370. Your answer is 375 horsepower. Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. The dash assembly is installed in the Daytona. Looks awesome, works perfect. Chrome Dome got all of the brake system working, got the system flushed out, that's up to par. Now we can move the Daytona back over to the bin pack and install our brand new accurate exhaust system. Today we're putting the Daytona on the lift and gonna raise it up. Hopefully it's the last time we have to do that. Uh, so the last few things that we have left is installing the radiator. Then once it's up in the air, we can connect the transmission cooler lines, the lower radiator hose, button all that area up. We just got our accurate exhaust system in, so we're gonna put that on. I'm gonna walk everybody through the process of installing that correctly on one of these cars so that you don't make any mistakes. Let's get the radiator over here. And do you have the fan shroud cleaned up and ready to go on? It's an original shroud, if I remember right. We're right there. Okay, uh, Josh grabbed the radiator. That is a, uh, a brand new Glen Ray radiator, 054. It's the correct Glen one Ray. for the Daytona. Yeah, Tom didn't want to take a chance, and I don't blame him on uh, on a used one. They just they're 40 years old. You can rebuild them, but if you got people like Glen Ray making brand new ones that are correct with the numbers, with the cap, with the overflow hose on it, with all the little I mean, look at the things on this. Wow, look here, the multi rib overflow hose right there. These are the correct brackets, the correct shroud brackets, the correct nipples for the wow. cooling lines. Everything came in that box ready to go on that car, and the most important part, the original number. You'll notice that the fan shroud has three attaching nuts and studs on what would be the driver's side and only two 
Turn around and show everybody on the passenger side. So this has to go in place first because there's no way this can be on that and lower it down inside the engine compartment in front of the fan. There's not enough room. So this one has to go on first. These are actually designed to rest on the stud, on the bolts. We've got the lower bolts in place. These are the correct, all four of the fastening bolts. They got the correct captive washer on it and the correct finish head. These, the lower ones are in place. So all you have to do, make it simple, real simple, is you rest that radiator down on it like that. Oh, then you can pull this up and get the, the bolt started in it. And we're just gonna walk that safe. down in there. Do you guys need a light? Well, eventually it wouldn't hurt to be able to see what we're doing, maybe. I'm doing good on this side. I gotta go down probably. Oh, what a beauty, huh? I'm almost to the bolt. I'm in line for the bolt. See, and what's cool about the way Mopar did that is with those two bolts that are anchored into the core support on the bottom, it just allows the radiator to set there. I mean, we haven't even put the top ones in it, but we know it fits, we know it's down flush. You can look at the height here of the tie bar, the upper tie bar, the upper core support to the radiator and make sure that's set and right. If you want, you can bring one side up just a little bit. Like this one actually looks to me like, that's right on. You got that side ready to go on. That's it. Ah. You get her? I gotta it's come down nice. a little here. Okay, mine's on. Yeah, you're in. Beautiful. These are the transmission cooler lines right here. Back in the day, the way that Chrysler and most of the companies would cool the fluid going th through the transmission was to run it through the bottom of the radiator. So that's what they've done. This line and this line go through the bottom. There's a port down here. It doesn't intermix with the water. It's just a cooling chamber down in here. That will allow the fluid to go through it, get cooled, and return back to the transmission. So we have to hook those up. And when you do it, if you look right there, You'll see that I'm fitting on there from the standpoint of it's just resting, but you see it's at an angle. This comes out straight and this goes back. You want this to be relaxed and setting perfectly straight with the nipple before you go forcing the outer nut down. So it needs to basically go towards the driver's side and right there. So now you're not gonna take any chances of cross threading this when you put it on. It should go on by hand just like that. If this thing was at an angle and you go to try to put that down, you can cross thread it going on to this. You just made yourself a big mess. So he's gonna tighten up the transmission cooler lines. We're gonna let it down, get the rest of the hardware, raise it back up again, button up the radiator and move on to the exhaust system. Well, now that we got our radiator and shroud all in place, we're going to open up all our accurate exhaust, take a look at it and get ready to fit it under the car. You know, I probably put uh, over the years maybe maybe a dozen of these exhaust systems on from Accurate. Tom down there, we've had him on before, we've talked to him before. He's really dedicated to trying to make these systems accurate, which is why they call his business Accurate Exhaust. We needed this exhaust. I kind of sort of forgot to order it. We needed it today. Um, he built the system yesterday and test fitted on a car to make sure. He always test fits them. So I know he's got a B body with a 440 and RB engine in it, the raised block. And if it fit on that, it should fit on ours. What's cool about it is it goes on exactly in the same increments, in the same segments, in the same sections as the factory exhaust. The H pipe increases the performance by balancing the exhaust from the left manifold to the right manifold. So again, I've not the most guru of, of all exhaust systems in the world, so I'm not sure why the 71 six barrel didn't use that. But uh, people will add those to aftermarket systems because it'll also improve, improve the performance. Mark, I don't know, it says Hemi. Hemi mufflers are the mufflers that, that Chrysler called them, that everybody calls them. That is the correct muffler. That's a duplicate of the original. They were called Hemi mufflers even though they were on a 440 car. I see. So that's right. There's our beautiful chrome exhaust tip. Can't get much better. Okay, so we start always start with putting your H pipe, your head pipe on. Do you got some hardware there? Yes sir. This is a nice system. It goes right in place. Sets hang on. Go back. 
sorry. Struggle muffler. Oh, it's the same. It's the same exact thing. God dang it. Look at look at the transmission pan. That's crooked Con compared to the K member. Okay. How God. does that happen? Well, it's just we put everything together on the ground on the K member. You don't know if everything's relaxed or not. Okay, what we need to do, that side needs to come down. You usually want it all resting. You don't want to have to prop one side up. So we need to loosen up. Most likely, it's between these motor mount bolts, the transmission mount bolt. This is already flush up against here. And the K-member looks level to the car. So it's sitting crooked. You know when you set the engine down on the cradle, you could go a little bit to the one side and because those go uphill, going to one side would raise one side up. So it may even be that we have to loosen up these lower ones, which we probably should, raise the front of that engine up and see if we can get it to settle into place. The cross member looks straight though. I'll bet you that's okay. I will just bet you. So that uses those big bolts and they're just barely fit through the holes, don't they? So, so it just yes. managed to walk itself. So it's probably them. where the motor sets into the cradle itself, so. Uh, yeah, we're graveyard cars, we do these things every day, but until you get everything in the car and squared into position, you can't always see what I just saw, which is that the K-member fits the frame rails, the car is set in square and level on the hoist, but the engine and transmission are cockeyed in there. So if I hadn't caught that and we put the exhaust in it, eventually that will settle down to where it finds it, you know, water seeks its own level. That engine's a heavy motor, so eventually it probably would find its way down to being level, but in the meantime, everything would be crooked built around it. The exhaust system, it would also cause a vibration in it. So what we're doing right now is we're gonna loosen up the motor mounts to the block and the motor mounts to the K-member. And we're gonna find out if that just falls down as soon as we loosen them, it may. It may just do that. Or it may be that the engine needs to be raised up on the driver's side, thus dropping the side on the passenger side. So that's what they're doing right now. They're loosening everything up. And once we get that square, then we can get the exhaust on it and finish that up. So here's another great example of what can go wrong. <laughs> Everything. Let's take it back. Anybody happen to know where the drive shaft is? Seriously, Mark? Guess what we have to look at? Daytona's going great. We got the radiator, fan shroud, all the plumbing is connected. All that's left is the exhaust system from Accurate. And we were just ready to put that in when I discovered that the engine was set and crooked in the cradle. So loosening up the motor mount bolts didn't work. Um, there's a little bit of play between the bolt and the actual hole that goes into the block and goes into the mount. So sometimes it's just like raised high in the saddle. So you loosen them up, goes clunk. Uh, that's not the case. So my guess is it just needs to come over a little bit towards the driver's side. So they're getting out one of the free jacks that go underneath it. They're gonna preload this side of the exhaust manifold and hopefully that drops this side down and raises that side up. You have to be able to pull that jack out and have it setting under its own natural uh, weight and then you know it's level. It's that little pad there. Yep, right on it. So what he's gonna do is they're gonna rotate that side up and see if that doesn't just walk around like oh, it's yeah, supposed to. Man. See, it's already starting to walk into position. Nice, nice. Hang on there, let me put an eyeball on her. Go ahead and let off the jack. Let's see if it stays. No. Nope, we went right back. Go ahead and go back up again. So in that case, are we just gonna have to tighten it with the jack in place? No, no, you don't. You want it to set under its own load in its own natural position. So what it means is the engine needs to physically go that way just a little bit while it's while we got it under a load here so um best way to do that we need to be able to pry like that right there without hurting anything this happens from time to time uh, you're putting an engine on a k-member outside the car so it's a little difficult to tell if it's setting perfectly level in the saddle so we loosened up the motor mount transmission mounts that allowed us to reposition it past the point where it needed to go so that when we let go of it and it relaxes it should be setting level so we're just gonna back this off and see. So far so good, don't move, don't move, we'll be happy. And there it is. Am I right? I'm always right. Pretty much. Can you get the bolts out here? I would love to. Okay, let's put this. Okay. 
Let's take it back. Anybody happen to know where the drive shaft is? Oh, God, that dang. Was Darren's that's Darren. Department. That's Darren. One thing after the next. Why isn't the drive shaft in it? Is he still, is he still here taking a nap? Where is it? Is it detailed? So here's another great example of what can go wrong. <laughs> Everything. It's late, it's almost midnight, I'm tired. These guys, they're tired. We're just trying to finish up the car so we can get it done on time for Tom. Thought that was a reasonable thing to do. And we've been Darren, Darrenized again. We have to have the drive line in before we can put the exhaust up because of the H pipe. And it appears to be nowhere around. Can't find it, needs, you know, who knows if it's been cleaned up, new U joints put in it. So we're just brick wall. Yeah. Game time. Uh, Mark, I got a headache. Uh. Forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Five, four, one, eight, six, eight, six. So after I make 12 phone calls to Darren, I hear his phone ringing in the front office when I go up front. He's asleep. Yeah. Hmm. You know? So I got his ass awake. He tells me that the drive shaft's been here for three days. He just forgot to give it to Josh to get it detailed. The guys are putting it in the car now, buttoning up the U-joint straps. Now we can get back to where we were with the exhaust system, putting the H-pipe on and the rest of the system. All right, if we got the bolts in place, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. How long are you guys gonna milk this for? Dude, Dude nice to up. see you, you pig-eared monkey. <laughs> Look at you, you balls. Monkey. Why weren't you I would have been done yeah. with this by this myself. This is the same crap that happens every time. He's gone while all the problems are are happening, and then he comes in. What was the problem? Yeah, I just took it together. five minutes. Uh, what? Yeah. Let's get it cool, ain't you? Yep. You monkey ass. <laughs> yeah. After all the smoke clears and we're all done fighting, classic Royal comes strutting in without a worry in the world. What's a going on? Well, I'll tell you what's a going on. You should have been here two hours ago to help do the project so we didn't have these problems. Are you okay there, Mary? You need some help? No. You got the Why bolts? are you trying to put you it got through the there? Bolts? That, that's, that's my point. That, exactly, is my point. You see him? The system is designed to go together. One guy, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Yeah, four guys in there. Only one of them with a brain. I'm not talking about you. The accurate exhaust system, I've said it before a dozen times, it is the best system we've ever used. It duplicates the original look, it duplicates the original sound, and if I didn't have the three guys that I had putting it together, it would have been done in 15 minutes. You get that yet, Josh? Yeah. You got them started? Yep. All right, Darren, get me a 11 sixteenths, I believe. Give me 11 sixteenths uh, socket, 3 8 drive socket with a wobbly on it, about an 18 inch extension, and a ratchet, please. And you got the wrench to hold the top on? The, is it a 5 8 on yeah, top? Yeah, 5 8 Today, Mary, I'd like to get well, these Mark, tightened down so they can get at. the rest of them. I told you it's in the right locker drawer, the, the vertical drawer, the big one that looks like a, a locker. I've got a whole bunch of miscellaneous sockets in there. Seriously, Mark? This is what we have to look at? I come over here to get some tools out of the drawer because I don't know where the tools are in this new big fancy toolbox. Here's an open the door and boom, there's a picture of the chipmunk there with XOXO and his signature there. That's the same look I get from him any time I want anything or ask where my parts are in my car. It's, you know, it's just ridiculous. The whole reason for the picture is just to remind people that this is my toolbox, okay? And, and if so, if you go to open a door and you see my face on it, you're going to remember that face and you're going to know darn good and well. Put the tool back, okay? Don't lose it. If you do lose it or you break it, you tell me about it, okay? So it's, it's, not, a, it's not some self-indulgent thing that I put it there for. To worry about. I don't think Josh. Even if I could beat him up, I'd, I'd get tired before I was done. You know? That's exactly what I do to you. I'd bring your ass out of I think Mark could take Josh. Then I just, I'd river dance all over your face. I don't know what that is. River dance. I think, uh, you, I think Mark could take Josh. Oh, Darren. I'd like okay. to see your ass take. Can you grab that front one? I'd like to tighten up a little bit more. Sure thing. Are these level? We just need to let it down and set the tips, and the exhaust is done. Thank goodness. 
Well, please, Derek, let somebody know and you're letting the it car down. Why we try to do something that's a five-minute job? You make sure that it's a three-hour job. I didn't job. mess up any of that stuff, Mark. So once you have everything set on the front exhaust, it's just a matter of making sure that these exhaust tips come out straight out the back of the car and that they're not twisted like this. That's why you let it down to this height so you can actually watch it. Okay, so that's it. Everything is lined up. The tips are pointing out the back straight. Once we run the engine a few times, uh, we'll probably go back through. Tom recommends putting a little tack weld at all the joints. We've done that in the past, uh, but you just want to make sure you don't have any rattles or anything before you do that. Otherwise, exhaust done. Now that the exhaust is in the Daytona, it's starting to look finished underneath. We're almost there. We still need to bleed the brakes out, but you know, we got it. You guys drive me fat crap, but we got it. You know, why do you just do that constant laugh and that weird stuff? People are writing in all the time about that. People are writing in like that all the time. People are writing in like that all the time. you were. That was funny, Josh. I know this is the part of the week where you get excited because you think it's all over, right? You're going to be able to take a break now and, and vacation, go existential out somewhere. But we're not because remember, we got big stuff coming up. We got the dash installed, we got the heater box installed, we got that part of it buttoned up, right? Headliner's in, we're in good shape. Drive shaft, undercarriage buttoned up, brakes bled, exhaust system on, but. But what? Next week, we have Auto Metal Direct coming out to go over all the parts for the Superbird and talk about the placement and fitting of the parts that we have done already on the past cars. You know, our goal is to make somebody able to restore a car to where you couldn't tell that it was restored. Yep. They're very interested in how a shop like ours, who's the best in the world, is getting along with their sheet metal. Does that make sense? It's got some special meaning. They want that particular car restored, and it doesn't have all of its original sheet metal. It's too far gone. Legendary Interiors is coming out next week. They are going to help you clowns and me put the interior in the Dodge Daytona Charger so that we can get it done on time. What can I say about the legendary interior? It's, it's as close as any human being on this planet could make to the exact same way they were made back in the day. Did you work in these headrests yourself or did some beginner do them? They're the best in the world. Really? Wow, that's pretty high expectations you have of yourself and your shop. And well, it's us. not an expectation, it's a reality. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, Judas, nice work calling Tom. That's why he's here. Yeah. You know we're capable of finishing it though, right? I know you're capable of finishing it, but I wanted to have a little hand in oh, finishing it myself. Oh my God. It's awesome. I'm excited as can be. He had a few vacation days, sick days. Then we have to get it aligned and we have to get a leak fixed in the front of the transmission. We just have a little drip at the front of the transmission. What, what did you and do then wrong? we are ready to go for our maiden voyage for the first time in 30 years. You know, when I was a little kid, I had this dream. I saw a Superbird, big wing. My dad filled my childhood dream of having that Pinewood Derby car with the wing and the nose cone on it. Yeah. Tom is not going to be disappointed on this car. We did it once before, remember? I don't want to do it again. For the first time in 30 years, 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona, one of 503, 440 Magnum, 727 Torque Flight, 323 Sure Grip, rear end, red over white with a white wing. <laughs>